we're going live. Hang on. Yep, we're going live right now, so you should get out. I just think. Nope. Oops. Well, hello and welcome to uh, Sunshine Cathedral, Share in the Chair on this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, we are glad that you are here with us and joining us. Uh, it's uh, great for you to uh, uh, be with us, and we have a great uh, interview lineup for you this evening, and we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, and uh, we're glad that we are here with our senior minister, who is the uh, Reverend Dr. Dr. Watkins of the Sunshine Cathedral, with a uh, spiritual leader uh, we're going to be interviewing for the day. Uh, I am Robert Griffin, the Executive Minister of the Sunshine Cathedral. Uh, in my role, I would like to uh, invite you to watch our streaming videos, and uh, especially on Sunday mornings at 1030 when we go live for our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, and we invite you to uh, watch us on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, and follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have streaming programming every day of the week, and you can learn more about that at sunshinecathedral.org. Uh, if you appreciate our ministry and enjoy our programming, I also invite you to support the Sunshine Cathedral with your financial contributions. And there are several ways that you can give, and you can find those listed on the Sunshine Cathedral website as well. Our guest tonight is wonderful, caring, uh, my friend, everything I can think of right now, but uh, Rabbi Noah Kitty, uh, who is a graduate of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. She served a Jewish congregation in Vermont uh, before moving to Florida. Uh, Rabbi is currently the spiritual leader of Congregation ex Kind in Wilton Manors, and she is the former president of the Dolphin Democrats, uh, and the local press has named Rabbi Kitty one of 50 prominent community leaders and one of the top 100 LGBT movers and shakers in our community. Uh, she is well known in the interfaith work and is engaging homo uh, homeless and has uh, also spoken at the Sunshine Cathedral previously. And we look forward to having her back again at some point in the future. But yeah. tonight, Rabbi Noah Kitty is chatting with our senior minister, Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins. Darrell, is all yours. Well, thank you, Robert. And thank you, Rabbi Noah Kitty, for being with us. Um, we we hook up do things every once in a while, and I love it every time. Uh, sometimes it's on purpose. Sometimes we run into each other and get to do things together. But either I way, I always love it. Yeah. So um, I've got, what we do is we ask three questions of our guests that's about them, uh, about their lives or traditions or ministry or whatever. And then there's one question at the end we ask everybody. And if we have wind up with 400 guests, I hope we get 400 answers. That's, that's the joy of that question. Um, but first, it's all about you. So you're a graduate of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, and that's in Philadelphia or the area? Right. Well, just outside of Philly in Wincote. Yes. Um, and I've known some of uh, some people who've been adjuncts there. They had other ministries, but they would adjunct at, at that school. And, um, but what I have found is when I talk about, in fact, there was a point, Robert will remember this, 20 something years ago, uh, because I'm a religious seeker. And I was actually looking at Reconstructionist uh, Judaism uh, as a path. Wow. And uh, had found a rabbi in Maryland that I was going to, uh, and then I got called to a church. And so, <laughs> and that kind of, but anyway, it was, it was actually something, um, Mordecai Kaplan fascinated me. I loved his, his, the stuff he'd written. And, but what I find is, even Christians who know about Judaism or know something about Judaism or have Jewish friends don't really sometimes know a lot about Reconstructionist Judaism. I've even known some Jewish people who didn't like, oh, what's that? Right. Maybe they, maybe they weren't so engaged. Um, so anyway, people, people know when you say Orthodox reform, they, they get it. Conservative, maybe a little less known uh, to the uninformed or whatever. And then Reconstructionism or Reconstructing Judaism, uh, a well-kept secret in lots of places. So could yes. you just give us what's it about? It's an American, it, like it's 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 like the jazz of religion, right? It's from the U.S. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, to, what? So, just so that people will know what we're talking, what is that? What is reconstructing Judaism? Well, first, to, first to put your question in in context, I think if you ask your average person on the street, uh, what's the difference between Methodist and Lutheran, they would go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, when it comes to interdenominational separations, it's, it's kind of an inside job, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but Reconstructionist Judaism, as you mentioned, um, is a uniquely American denomination. Um, it was um, 
It was created by a uh, amazing rabbi, Mordechai Kaplan, who uh, was classically trained in Europe, came to America, absolutely orthodox. Um, he was born in 1888. So um, he, he comes from that kind of um, very traditional world over 100 years ago. So what does Reconstructionism posit? That uh, it understands Judaism as the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. Um, so it presumes contrary to, well, not really contrary, but um, there was a people and then there was a religion. Mm. Um, even though within the religion, uh, we understand that religion came first and then people came. Right. You know, God imagined us and then created the world. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a shared myth. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Um, uh, but with Reconstructionism, I, again, um, it understands the focus not as God commanded us, but as human beings, this is how we respond. So what, what do I mean by that? Reconstructionist Judaism absolutely uh, um, respects, honors, um, and studies all our traditional volumes, scripture. It's absolutely embraced. Um, we come away with something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Right. So yes, God commanded us to do X, Y, Z. First, we study about X, Y, Z. So we have a good understanding of what it is we're supposed to do or supposed to avoid. And once we have that personal understanding, then we can say, you know, in honesty, yes, I can do this. Uh, no, I will avoid that, whatever. So the first thing is not do this because God said so. The yeah. first thing is God said this, let's study it. Mm -hmm. So it's a much more engaged way um, to understand Judaism. Yeah. You know, it always you should only do what you understand. Oh, that's, it has always seemed to me that Reconstructionism theologically is pretty rational, almost humanistic, uh, but liturgically is more stickler, very traditional, very like liturgically sort of high uh, right. in the worship traditions. Uh, can you say something about right. that? Have, have I observed that correctly? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, liturgically, Reconstructionist Judaism is as conservative as conservative Judaism. Almost. <laughs> um, but socially, it's to the left of reform. Mm -hmm. So it has that um, very interesting, almost, you, you see it a lot in uh, Reconstructionist writings, the term neo-Hasidism. Mm. Neo-Hasidism. Yes. So it's, it's a way, again, it's a, a way of understanding and approaching the world um, below the surface. Nice. Excellent. So what I mean by that is in classical Hasidic thought, um, the huge majority of the writings are, are based in their understanding of Jewish mysticism. So in Hasidism, you, you uh, engage with the mitzvot, you perform the mitzvot because, not because God said so, but because in doing so, you will participate in the repair of the world. Mm -hmm. That God gave us these commandments, and traditionally there's 613. Many we can't do at all because they have to do with the temple in Jerusalem. The ones we have left, you know, 
we, we're struggling with those. So we have enough, thank you. Um, but each one, each mitzvah that we do brings the Messiah one day closer, brings the perfection of the world one day closer, and that's the impetus. So when I say neo-Hasidism, um, it's not Hasidic because um, they, uh, the Hasidic communities are extraordinarily traditional, uh, like 18th century traditional, um, but their thought is so engaging, you know, wow. To, I think it's much easier to explain to a child why they shouldn't rip up a piece of paper on Shabbat is not to say it's forbidden on Shabbat, but to say when we rip up a piece of paper on Shabbat, we delay the coming of the Messiah, which actually is pretty, pretty heavy in itself. But um, you could do it in the other way, saying when we refrain from ripping things on Shabbat, we encourage the Messiah to come one day sooner. One day sooner. Love so, it. So that's neo Hasidism. Nice. So it, it takes that thought um, and puts it in a much more modern context. Modern. Okay, excellent. Well, now all of that, so that's some about your background and your theological training and all of that. Meanwhile, you're you're the Reconstructionist leader of, of a reform congregation um, that shares space with a Christian congregation on the property of a secular organization. Uh, and since I've known you, you've been very open to interreligious collaboration. Why is interfaith work and dialogue so important? Why are you very grounded in your tradition and still so open to so many other ah. people, their experiences and willing to share? Because we share the world. Yeah. You know, we live with each other. Yeah. And honestly, I love living with all kinds of people because it 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 helps me be a better me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it uh, makes me appreciate my traditions more, but also your traditions more because if all I did was stay in my own little bubble. And in many ways I have my own bubble, but um, you know, all I would know is what my little bubble knows. Yeah. And um, that's not enough. I believe we, you know, I, I believe we're here, A, to repair something that we uniquely can repair and part of that repair is, is bringing peace to the world, which means you have to talk to people, which means you need to leave room for other people. Yeah. In my own experience, uh, I, went to, I went to, my seminary was in New York and, um, and then I, I, more studies in, in Massachusetts. So kind of a uh, diverse place, you know, where all kinds of people live in these, in these places. And, um, and so I had a, my ethics professor was an Orthodox Jew and my uh, wisdom literature teacher was a conservative uh, Jewish scholar. And one of my New Testament professors was a reform Jewish. He was a New Testament scholar, but he was reform Jewish. He had been Methodist growing up in the, in the South. He married a Jewish woman, he converted, and, uh, but he became a New Testament Bible scholar. Of course, Amy Jill Levine is an is a Orthodox Jew in Tennessee, New Testament Bible scholar at Vanderbilt. Um, right. I, I, I am so much, I'm so much richer and more fulfilled in my space because I have been instructed by people from other spaces. I wouldn't, right. I know more about what, about my own thing because of having relationships with people who know other things. And right. uh, yeah, so uh, I, uh, Paul Nitter is a Roman Catholic who also practices Buddhism. And he's written a book called Without Buddha, I Couldn't Be a Christian. And I think that's almost true about everyone I've ever met. Without, without the strokes they added to my canvas, I wouldn't be the me I am. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I think interreligious dialogue is so important. And people who just refuse it, my way is the only way. And, and if you don't agree with me, then we have nothing to say to each other how poor a life that has to be. So uh, I'm, I'm glad for this sharing. Now, yeah. you're, the, oh, go ahead. 
Well, also, so much of our histories intersect. Yeah. So I know from my side what happens in 1412. But I don't know from your side what happens in 1412 mm. or from the Sheikh's side what mm. happens in 1412. Right. Um, so it, as you, as you said, it, it enriches my stories when I have, you know, your chapter in it. Right. And if we, uh, sometimes Christians will complain that we're too syn synchronistic, you know, that we're too, we adopt too many other things into our Christian experience or whatever. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know that Passover uh, that's, we didn't make that up. We, we, we borrowed that. We recast it, we redefined it, but it was already a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know that uh, two thirds of our Bible is just somebody else's Bible. Uh, we took that and, you know, and if we really want to know what it means, maybe we should ask the people it came from, you know, ask, ask some of them sometimes uh, instead of inserting a different theology onto it. And so people don't, people, Christians don't often realize Christianity is a syncretic religion. <laughs> it, is, it already is on day one. Uh, mm -hmm. And then when you add in the, the pagan holidays of Christian and Easter, and then, so why, so I'm always like, why stop there? Well, let's ask the Baha'i what they think about something. And if it's good, let's, let's use it because we are by Christians anyway. We, we don't have the, if we had a tradition, it would be Judaism because all the guys, St. Paul and Jesus, all the guys that we make such a big deal about, they were Jewish and they only knew Judaism. So, right. um, so we're syncretic anyway. And if we weren't, we'd just be another, one of those other schools of Judaism that people are like, oh, what's that about? Uh, but we developed in another way and whatever. But yeah, that's, we do have a shared history. Right. So, which is exciting, I right. think. Right. Um, well, okay. So, so you're, you're uh, an ecumenical uh, leader and an interreligious and political leader, all of that community leader. Uh, and you lead a predominantly LGBTQ congregation. I believe it was the first such congregation, Jewish congregation in Florida. Maybe it still is. Uh, but I remember yes. the previous rabbi, when I first got here, said it was certainly the first, and at that time, the only, uh, identified, the yeah, I mean, I know there's LA, I know there's uh, New York, but this, at time, is unique in, in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, how, th does much of your work involve helping people reconcile their sexual orientation uh, with their faith? That's a big deal in my life. Maybe Jewish practitioners are way ahead of us. Maybe they make piece of that easier sooner or whatever maybe it's not even an issue for them uh, how much of your of your work is helping people integrate all of them their faith their, their sexuality their humanness all of it in an affirming way um i would i would say a fair amount yeah although um you know it's it's interesting um being an lgbt synagogue because pretty much all of us grew up in a straight synagogue, right? Because mm -hmm. there were no gay synagogues was, right? 50 years ago. Um, so uh, by the time folks come to us, however, you know, by the time they get to Florida, um, <laughs> they've, they've reached a point in their life where, where they're pretty much comfortable with pretty much everything. You know, they're, they've reached an age, they've achieved some wisdom and perspective. So it's very helpful. However, not, um, not everyone is equally okay with all of our identities. Yeah. So, um, Theologically, Judaism can be uh, very harsh when it comes to traditional opinions of LGBT people. Um, it's funny though, socially, you know, if you, if you, you know, let's say 50 years ago, um, actually there is something written where uh, and this is in the Talmud, so it's 500 years old. And they say, okay, let's say uh, you're, you're a guy and you're going on a trip and you're walking there. So it's in Europe and it's in the woods. So it's, it's dark and dangerous. Uh, so you go with a companion and you have to, you know, spend the night somewhere 
because your destination is so far away. So what happens, you know, everybody's poor, right? Um, you can't even afford a horse, you have to go on foot. So you share a room with your friend. And the question is asked, should we think there's something funny going on between these guys since they're sharing a bed? And the answer is, ah, don't worry about that. <laughs> don't worry about that. Uh, they, Jews aren't gay, so yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> now, you could say how, you know, we're being ignored and pushed aside and, you know, made invisible. And that's true, but it's also true in the response to say, this is not something we're going to look in people's homes for. We're not going to check people's pots, as it were, to see if it's kosher. We're just not going to go there. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in historically in Judaism, you didn't generally hear from the pulpit you know, the men saying, oh, it's terrible, they're monsters. You didn't hear that so much. Okay. You, you were invisible. Right. But you weren't targeted. Right. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, admittedly, though, it's only been in the past 20 years, maybe 30 years. Um, that uh, traditional leaders um, have have you know flung open the doors, but you know it's only because we were banging and pushing on the doors yeah. for thirty years before that. Um, yeah. So there is that tension. To answer yeah. your question somewhat more directly, there is still some tension some in personal identity and religious acceptance. Well, I know when. When you, when you speak at Sunshine Cathedral and you are a beloved preacher at Sunshine Cathedral, you have this amazing way of uh, using exegesis and Hebrew and sometimes even some, some Midrash. You, you bring it all together to bring out really gay affirming and, and, and gender diverse and all kinds of things from this right there in our scriptures that we would have missed if you weren't there telling us about it. <laughs> and uh, that is so, that, that's a great, even that, so uh, we, uh, I, I don't know how much you have to do with your congregation, but when you do it for mine, they love you for it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, ask, uh, first of all, before I ask you the last question, let me uh, have you give a little plug. First of all, do you do interfaith marriage weddings? Or do, do you I? only do Jewish weddings? No, I will do an interfaith. You will do uh, interfaith. It okay. will depend on the couple. It's not an automatic you have thing. to meet but, them and all that, of course. But it's but, not an automatic thing that I'll marry two Jews either. Right, right. I, you know, it's the one, it's the one of the few spots where I get to say, I'm not gonna. Yeah. 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 I, um, yeah. And what time is your, uh, ser your, your services? Uh, uh, your worship Every service? Friday night at 8 p.m. on Facebook. Thank you. Right. Yes, on Facebook, uh, on the Ed Time Facebook page. On the Ed Time page. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So, uh, and er people are welcome. They don't have to know what's going on. They can just check it out, or. I believe so. I believe they can just click on it. Okay. No, I mean, are, are they welcome to do so for? Oh, absolutely. From your like we're not being sure, voyeurs sure. if we do that. Okay. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. It's it's the same way in our physical space. You know, the doors open. Excellent. Excellent. That's so, great. It's like your place. The door's open. Exactly. We're so similar in lots of ways. And we've actually shared times and spaces before. So, yeah. Um, yeah. all right, then. Um, then uh, my final question for you, is, what happens when we die? Uh, well, a few things happen <laughs> um, when you die. Yeah. Well, um, one is, of course, um, you're dead. Uh, so, Again, in Judaism, when you die, you're dead and you're gone and we love you and we'll miss you forever. Yeah. Um, but that's what happens to your body. What happens to your soul is, again, in the mystical literature, um, your soul goes back to heaven where it originated and it stays there until God determines it's time for your soul or the soul to come back to earth and 
you know, vivify a body. So, and there's a story I, I tell. Um, well, first of all, there- well, I might have a recycled soul? Mm, sort of. Okay. Um, the soul is eternal. It's the eternal part of us. So it's, it's what I used to explain. You know, when you meet somebody and you just like them, they've yeah. said four words to you and you're, you know, it's like, come live with me. I love you, right? Yes. And, and you can meet somebody else and they have not even said a word and you're like, ah, right? You, you don't know either one of them, but something, something connects. So I call that the soul. And in Judaism, we, we don't believe in reincarnation as such. Meaning, um, we all have souls. When we die, our body goes into the ground or wherever somebody puts it, and our soul returns to heaven. Um, when the soul is sent back, as it were, um, it's almost a clean slate. And this is how it's explained in the mystical literature and mystical literature as opposed to scientific literature. If you, if you try to examine mystical literature too closely, it will just disappear in your hands. <laughs> it's not science. Right. right. It's a way to explain things we currently don't understand, but we know that something is happening. Right. So the soul goes back up to heaven. God says, oh, I see a Chaim Yankel is coming to be born, you, you know, that's, that's where you go. So the soul goes back and lives its life. And, you know, when God determines it's time for the soul to come back, the soul comes back, the body stays. So it's not reincarnation the same way a Hindu would understand reincarnation or a Buddhist would understand reincarnation. In other words, it's not a punishment to come back. Right. Excellent. It's what we do. Yeah. That's really beautiful. So thank you so much for that. And thank this is this the time has flown by. I knew it would. Uh, I always love chatting with you. Even when I have to share you with the internet. Uh, I always love ch chatting okay. with you. Robert, uh, wind us up. All righty. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we have lots of folks from literally around the world with us this evening as I'm watching this uh, broadcast tonight. Uh, but again, thank you, Rabbi Noah Kita, for being with us. Uh, and also, just a reminder, uh, you can always go to sunshinecathedral.org and find all the ways that you can support the Sunshine Cathedral. And I also invite you to uh, uh, stop by uh, XCOM website also and find ways that you can support them as well. Uh, especially we all need community at this particular point in time. So they're offering pro online programming. We're doing it as well. So we invite you to just, just, just take a, a part of all that's going on that's available to us out there. Uh, and of course, again, join us on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time for our live stream at Sunshine Cathedral. Again, thank you for everyone. And thank you, Reverend Noah Kitty. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Robert. Thank you, Terrell. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.